Excellent. Um, I'm not as good uh, good looking as Brian, so my apologies <laughs> if any of you were here to see him. Um, well, he's at one of our partners now. Uh, let's see. So today I will be speaking on, uh, well, there are two things I'll cover. The hidden costs of the cloud. We did a survey, uh, uh, it was just released a couple of weeks ago, and there are some interesting findings. It's a worldwide survey, you'll see that in a second, where, where everything came from. But uh, I think the findings were interesting, and I'm hoping that you guys will find them so as well. And then secondly, um, ozone, which was the, uh, the topic that was listed on here, so I'm hoping all you are ready for that. Um, why it's important, and give you a couple of uh, actual details behind how we at least look at it and how it works in the, uh, in the grand scheme of things. So, all right, the survey. Details on where it comes from. Uh, these will all be in the uh, whatever it is that they post uh, on the, on the uh, cloud, in the cloud. So you guys can take a look at it. Um, there were 102 uh, uh, surveys from here in the uh, U.S. Um, should be at least telling uh, when you see the rest of this. What we came up with, um, this was not government centric. However, uh, it does demonstrate how uh, we should protect the cloud uh, from the UV. I mean, that, that's what the ozone does, right? Um, protects the, uh, the, the world from the UV radiation from the sun. And what we found was that uh, this, this is a very interesting product that can go through and, and make those same kind of protections uh, through single sign-on and identity management and uh, some actual data protections. Um, when you're looking up here, um, rogue, cloud, rogue cloud implementations, uh, that's something that um, you will see as you get uh, further along. These are these are people that are further uh, further down the road of actually implementing these cl uh, cloud scenarios. So there's supposed to be lessons learned. Okay, how many of you are actually looking at the cloud seriously? Okay, how many have actually started implementing something in the cloud? Fantastic. So you're at least uh, part of the 89%. The rest of you are either lying or not really uh, listening, which is cool too. Um, cloud services, email management, uh, that SaaS, you know, Gmail was kind of Hotmail, et cetera, but nowadays it's a little more important than that. A uh, few of you are probably going over to uh, either Microsoft <coughs> Solutions. We've got one heck of a product, um, but I won't name the uh, uh, the name because I don't want to be a pitch pitch guy. Um, and then backup and management, uh, we won't talk about that. Security, uh, that is the focus of this talk. So why is this important? Um, so the reason that most people are going to the cloud is for cost savings and economies of scale, right? So if I'm the sales manager for, you know, whatever uh, implementation uh, and I decide that my 50 uh, sales reps are going to use salesforce.com um, and then I have the guy over in the other department, you know, maybe he's covering the East Coast and he's doing the same thing and he sets up his own. 50-person uh, account on Salesforce. Well, now you have duplication. You're kind of defeating the purpose of the economies of scale. Um, but most importantly, it's going to be data protection. You're putting information within the cloud, whether it's personally identifiable, whether it's uh, government information, company sensitive, private, PII, et cetera, it shouldn't be there. Um, or at least it shouldn't be there and not be protected. So as soon as you put that information in there and you don't have adequate protections on it because it doesn't go through IT, um, it doesn't go through the you know, chief security officer or the CISO, whatever, whoever you want to call it, um, it doesn't go through their office, well, guess what? 
they're not going to be thinking about the kind of protection that's necessary. So, at the bottom there, 23% fine for privacy violations in the cloud. State of California, uh, I think it's Senate Bill 1618, um, your privacy protections uh, for, the, for the state citizens. Uh, Massachusetts has a similar law. The European Union, uh, their data protection directive has been in place for since 95, so I don't know, is that 20 years yet? It's getting there. Um, you put this stuff up there and you get fined and that's an added cost. Um, if you actually go through and, and prove that you're meeting your requirements, that's going to be necessary for some of your audits and guess what? You can't do it if you're a rogue, if, if you're doing this on your own. Oh, come on. Fantastic. No worries. There we go. E-discovery. Um, any lawyers in the audience that will care to admit it? Okay. Um, E-discovery, e even with the uh, Freedom of Information Act, the Sunshine Laws, I come from Florida, um, you know, we're supposed to have a transparent government. Apparently you guys have one here as well. Um, Illinois, on the other hand, not so much. Um, anyways, uh, unable to meet. So 66% of uh, the respondents missed e-discovery deadlines. The judicial system doesn't care if you have all of this stuff published somewhere if you can't provide it, you're going to get fined. You know, you're going to have problems. You're going to maybe be held in contempt of court. Um, now, not as big of an issue for uh, state government folks, maybe, but it, it is something to keep in the back of your mind that when somebody goes through and asks, hey, your SAS implementation that you're going through, Your SAS implementation that you're going through, uh, you, you just, you know, I, I need the 50 emails that are on the uh, XYZ uh, project. Where are they? And you can't provide them, you're going to have problems. And lastly, uh, um, certificates, uh, data in motion protection. Um, how many of you guys actually have ever implemented TLS, SSL, done anything with? Uh, like secured HTTPS on a website. Man, you guys, come on. More of you should be raising your hands. This is important stuff. Um, you're passing passwords in the clear, you're going through and making transactions. If you don't have these kinds of protections in place, um, you know, would you really go through and, and enter your banking information without having that little lock at the top, you know, the green bar? If you say yes, I would love to know you personally because, well, anyways. Um, the biggest problem with cloud implementations, are you going to go through and load, um, are you able to load your own certificates onto, you know, your cloud provider? Is that something that uh, they, they, even, they even allow? And if so, have you ever tried managing uh, those kinds of certificates? Um, it can be tough, and as soon as they expire, yes, they do expire once every one or three years, depending on the implementation. How do you swap them out? What happens if a certificate is actually uh, revoked? Um, if it is compromised, that happens. Um, that's how, I don't know if any of you guys follow security or not, but uh, there was a, uh, a virus a couple of uh, years ago uh, based on, it was called Stuxnet. It was the one that went through and, and blew up the Iranian centrifuges. Okay, so yes, it was probably a state government. I'm not going to ascertain who it was. That's not my job. But um, all of that was precipitated by stolen certificates. If your cloud provider doesn't allow you to revoke a certificate, what do you do? Okay, so the four, uh, the four recommendations that came out of that particular survey, um, platform agnostic, fantastic. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are carrying around iPhones, iOS, iPad, Android, Mac, PC, 
all of those are different. You start going through and, and uh, making things that are specific to that particular uh, device. You're kind of locking yourself in and, and you're going to have issues later on when the next whatever it is widget comes out. Now, um, so how do we implement the recommendations that came out of that, uh, that survey? And one of the things that we've been working on for about a year, year and a half, a little bit longer, um, we call it O3. It's supposed to be the, uh, the protection layer for the cloud. Um, you know, keep the UV radiation, UV rays off of, off of your actual cloud implementation. Put protection in there. So why? Top, you see uh, iOS, Android, SaaS, PaaS. Um, bring your own device. Anybody here actually gone into a, a cloud IaaS service? You know, put something on Amazon Web Services, maybe a Terramark, AT&T. Oh, look at that. Somebody finally. You, you, you're a popular gentleman here. You're doing a lot of work. Um, the cost savings are enormous. Okay? I, I don't know if any of you guys have actually looked at uh, what the operational expenses versus the capital expenses are um, on what you're doing day to day uh, within your data centers, but the Amazon Web Services, pennies, pennies per hour that you can go through and get a server that you could never even touch within your data centers. And the promise of cloud is that you can scale those automatically, um, automagically if you want to look at it that way. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the uh, Joint Propulsion Lab out of uh, the, uh, NASA runs it. But when they did their uh, lunar, uh, what was it, not lunar, Mars lander about, uh, what was that, six months ago? Who actually watched it? Anyone? No one? So that was done completely on, uh, on the cloud. That was an IaaS service. They went through, they auto-scaled that so that any time they had another, uh, I think it was 10,000 users that would sign on and watch it, they'd spin up another couple of servers. So the cost savings are enormous. You have to protect it, though. So these are from uh, a, a couple of years ago. But what I want you to notice, if you look on the left-hand side, um, they are principally going to be based on um, the actual people and the data that you know, you're trying to protect. Um, with the couple of exceptions like patch and vulnerability management, that's going to be that platform-centric um, piece. But the rest of these are all data. You know, protect the data and educate your people, and you have a possibility of actually making some progress and, and, and securing your cloud environment. So what we feel is that uh, this ozone layer uh, actually going through and having it so that these people can sit wherever it is that they, that they need to, wherever it is that they want to. If they're mobile workers, if they're uh, local within your premises, um, no matter what, put this thing in between uh, the cloud environment and your users. And wherever they reside, give them single sign-on. Okay? One time, that's it. They don't have to enter more passwords. They don't have to go through and, and take their uh, tokens out and, and punch in pins and things along those lines. It's in. Once they're in, everything on the back end is secured. Okay? So they, they get that single sign-on. You give them a consistent interface so that they're not having to go through and try to find 15 different passwords. I have a password vault on here for a couple other reasons. But um, you get this in place. And from a uh, corporate standpoint, from a government standpoint, you have deprovisioning that you can do. Somebody leaves the company, you don't have to go through and ask Salesforce to turn off their uh, user, username and password. You don't have to worry about, once you do everything in AD, you don't have to worry about going through and, and taking everything else out. Um, and the, uh, the smuggle in my home laptop. So 
people get used to what they like to do. Um, I mean, I'm guessing that some of you are probably Mac users. Most of you are probably PC users. Anybody in here use Linux? All right, two guys. Why does it have to be guys? Come on. I, can't. I, I need a woman to raise their hands uh, one time. All right, thank you. Oh, fantastic. So you're provisioning, you're, you're going to have issues if you're trying to do all this stuff, single, single product, um, something that's homegrown, et cetera. Instead, get something that's a COTS product that you know, goes through and, and takes care of all of this in the cloud. Um, you're, basing on, you're, you're putting this into the cloud. Um, you're putting your services into the cloud. Make your protections go along with it. So our O3 product uh, goes through. This is going to get a little more detailed because these are actual implementation details, um, how we approach it. Uh, there are a couple other vendors that are out there. They have similar approaches without quite as much breadth, and they aren't semantic. So we are still the uh, last single security player out there, and we like to uh, remind people that, that, we, that we know how it works. Um, OK, access control, information protection, visibility and compliance, policy management. You get your administrators, your systems, you know, whoever it is that goes through defines your, defines your policy. Your CISO says, hey, I don't want you to have bad passwords. Okay, I want you to use one-time tokens. Um, you know, I want whatever it is. I want to make sure that your passwords are compliant with whatever our internal policy is, even when you are going out to some third-party SaaS vendor. Okay? I keep using Salesforce. If any of you guys, who, anybody in here, uh, mail services, call a couple out. Who are you using? Anybody using cloud mail? Microsoft. Microsoft? Okay. How do you go through and actually check and make sure that your passwords that are on there follow your policy? Well, in this case, it's, uh, um, it's connected to our local AD, so we're providing okay. And that's going to work even when you're off-site, right? Okay, good. Now, what if you're using, you know, some other vendor? What if you're using some other product? You know, you're going to have issues. Okay. So, put your protection in the cloud. Uh, goes along with whatever it is that you're trying to protect um, that you're using as a cloud service. The reason that, uh, or the, the the topics that we find uh, important with O3. Um, it essentially is a cloud firewall. Um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a novel concept. Not novel, but uh, it, it's, it's one of the first of its kind. Um, handles each of these pieces. Identity security, uh, being able to federate passwords. If you are using that, the deprovisioning I mentioned earlier, somebody leaves the organization, you don't want them to have access later on. And, I mean, I'm not going to admit to being the guy that does that, but... You can definitely, somebody's using uh, your travel site, okay? Maybe you don't want them being able to get back in there later on and, and you know, I don't know, look things on there. Better examples, I'm sure. Um, DLP, data loss prevention. Anybody here have DLP within their organization? Same guy keeps raising his hand, shaking his head. Um, it's important. Uh, I worked at one of our bigger government customers, and I can tell you that there was an example of 10,000 personally identifiable records, uh, basically everything about the guy, that, uh, about all of these individuals. Um, one guy tried to, tried to swipe it. Um, he was a systems administrator, and we caught him with DLP. I was in the consulting ranks at one point, so I have practice as well as uh, uh, practical knowledge. Um, 10,000 records. Guy downloaded the database and was ready to walk off with it. He wanted to find out where he was going to be on the, uh, on the layoff rosters. You give, you, you give guys insider, uh, insider access, and exactly. He was laid off, by the way. <laughs> So, and lastly, being able to monitor where people are going and when they're going there. Um, maybe you want to make sure that your guys are actually working. 
not suggesting that uh, that doesn't uh, that that would ever happen, but you know, you, you can at least track when somebody's going through and, and accessing. I keep going back to Salesforce because in the corporate environment, that's pretty important. Um, I'm sure that you guys have homegrown uh, systems that you know track whatever spending. Um, maybe you don't want somebody accessing something from home. You can control that through uh, uh, through O3. So these are, uh, th these are examples of the uh, use cases, and yes, there are four of them that fall out of this. Um, I'll, I'll cover two of them. Um, okay, so there's, uh, th th there are two implementations, one's an on-site, one's an off-site. Uh, both of them rely on this intelligence center. That's where you're going to go through and uh, program what kind of policies go in to you know, your organization. And from there, those are pushed down to this gateway device, and the gateway device can either be on-premises if you're insistent on a private cloud. Um, don't get me started on private versus public, but um, if you have internal applications, that, uh, that, that, that gateway can then go through and make sure that uh, uh, the access to those is controlled. And external clouds, same thing. It, it, it's all brokered through that particular uh, gateway. And in the second example, oh, SAML and OpenID, um, that's the federation. Some of you that are implementing this stuff um, will know what those mean. Essentially, it, 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 you can go through and even use like Facebook or Google or something along those lines, they will federate, they will allow you to use what's uh, called sec see, security assertion markup language. And once you go out, you authenticate to them, they start passing tokens back and forth, and those tokens are not identifiable. They still allow you to go through and, and authenticate appropriately, but you're not actually using passwords or whatever it is that's specific to you. Um, The second is actually using our uh, gateway cloud where it's hosted. Um, this is probably the more compelling uh, case, especially if you have BYOD, if you have remote workers, et cetera. It's hosted, you don't have to worry about it, and it goes, it, it is in the cloud. Wherever your users are, it's there with them. So if they're trying to use uh, chatter or um, some sort of communication device, whatever your instant messenger is, um, it's there with them. Okay. Here's an actual uh, communications path. Um, the letter's at the bottom. So an administrator is going to go through to find a policy. It gets pushed down to that intelligence center. Um, the policy is then rewritten into something that uh, the gateway can actually uh, use and enforce. Employees then go through that gateway. Um, roaming employees are going to go through the same gateway. So if you have this on premise, then you are going to have to redirect uh, external employees back through the corporate uh, network. And if not, Everybody goes through the cloud. Allows you to uh, not duplicate network traffic, network resources, and overall it's a happier go luckier uh, implementation. So I have more stuff on the back end, but I'm not going to pull those out because it's probably going to not be as interesting if, in, if none of you guys are actually doing this stuff. Uh, David, we can probably talk later on. And you would be more interested in it. Any questions? So are you more security oriented right now? Or, I mean, Me this, personally or right here in, this in this session? But yes. Can you you can ask any questions you want. If I can't answer them, I will get you an answer. So say I have a service in Cloud A and I mm -hmm. want to move it. I don't like what I'm getting to Cloud A. I want to move it to Cloud B. Okay. How portable is that? How portable is well, say, any service? Any service in general? Not any service. 
services. I know some services won't be portable. Let's say the exchange service. So the Cloud Security Alliance, which I work with quite a bit, um, they are actually going through and defining those uh, that that portability, and that portability is a big problem. Um, you know, it's it's vendor lock-in. We call it stickiness um, in the you know in the sales industry. And uh, you, you, I mean, if you're selling things, you want it sticky, uh, but there are providers that are going through and trying to make sure that they can that they are portable. And yes, so, so it, it's tough. Cloud, so if, if I understand it correctly, you you have a you might have a cloud service. You have one vendor, and you're moving to potentially another vendor, and you know you need to port your data, right? You know, really, what we're trying to do with O3 is we don't care what service you're using. We're going to provide that ozone layer that, that protects your users, your data, you know, um, you know, personal information, whatever the service be. Semantics in general provides. We are a cloud provider of certain services. Um, we also are. We also are creating a platform. If, if you if you walk away from today, think of the ozone correct, protecting us from UV rays. We're we're protecting you from losing data. Right. Really, it comes down to data. We're losing sensitive information. Um, and we're we don't really care what that service is. As far as moving the data and the portability of your data. That's probably going to be a contract you have with your certain your current provider, and how willing they are going to, you know, it's like he, like John John Paul Michael said, they want to keep you as as a customer, um, and these are things you have to think about before you sign a contract with a, with a cloud provider. It's, you know, in the event you know we, 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 you know contract expires, you need to migrate. How do we know our data leaves your system, right? We don't leave leave behind sensitive information. And, how you, how, you know, migration, uh, migration strategies. So. And that, that was actually one of the earlier findings. We, we've done this uh, survey that, that, that I spoke at the beginning about. Um, that was one of the findings from the first of those surveys that we did, was that that lock-in is one of the hidden costs that y you, will, you, you will face. And oh, by the way, if you don't have all of that in your contract to begin with, um, they're going to charge you for outputting it in some format. Yeah, we call it extraction. We call it extraction. You know, you know, ingestion. There's usually a charge to ingest data into a cloud service, and there's an extraction cost. And you know, before you guys, I mean, hopefully, as part of the, the conference today, you're learning these things, and you, you as you look at you know, cloud providers, you understand <coughs> those costs before you before you sign. So. Yes, ma'am. So as far as um, certifications, as far as like FIPS or uh, what kind of certifications are you looking for? For your cloud, the baseline for you, for example, FED, like federal level. Like FedRAMP, those types of things. Right. Um, so the first of the FedRAMP uh, certifications, just uh, I'm sorry, vendors. Um, I think the third-party assessors they just had the first of those that were actually given the okay. So nobody's FedRAMP certified yet. Um, there are parts of this that are going to be very useful in uh, FISMA uh, certifications, uh, low, medium, high. Y you can go through and actually. Make sure that policies are appropriate. You can go through. There's logging that we do that you're not going to get anywhere else because are you going to ask your SaaS provider how many times somebody logged into you know, Office 365? Are they going to give that to you? Um, probably not because most of the uh, service providers aren't collecting that information. And here, here I'll also add, so you know, the ozone layer is a, is, a, is a makeup of several of our products that we, you know, we are, are mentioning today. Um, but well, I'll, I'll tell you this, federal is a huge part of our business. And any federal regulation, we, we, we get certified or we're in the process of certifying. So if there's a specific regulation you're looking for, a specific uh, you know, spoke or, or one of these um, functions you're, you're really most interested in, we can talk offline. But um, we have, most of our products are, uh, have, have certifications.
yeah, and, and definitely get in touch with Troy, and, and he can get back in touch with uh, me. He can also swap cards, but we can we can find out what you're actually interested in and make security. sure that it happens. Well, you need a security based but, on but yeah. it comes down to what certification you're actually looking for. I mean, that's, that's just in general. Yeah, yeah, and I'd okay. say in general, we have most federal, if it's probably the federal certification, typically the states follow the federal certification. But you don't have it yet. No, 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 nobody has no. nobody has FedRAMP yet, but yeah, we have. Th there are other ones. That yeah, but there's lots of federal regulations, security yeah. regulations that we, uh, you know, we're, we're part of. Yeah. So one of the other things that I probably glossed over in uh, thinking that I was running slowly was uh, so information protection. O3 can actually go through and, and uh, DLP uh, make sure that information's not going through that firewall uh, that is sensitive. And then if it is, uh, and your administrators set up policies, um, encryption uh, can come into play, and, and that's based on PGP, which has all of those certifications that uh, we were mentioning earlier. Um, that encryption then keeps whatever it is information from leaking out of your uh, infrastructure. Yes, sir? The, your example about checking in with AD, does, it, does the AD have to be uploaded to, to the cloud, or does it have to go through the, does it have to go to the internal system? It's going to be implementation dependent. So if you if you have it uh, if you have it as a cloud service, if you're using our, uh, it, it will be implementation dependent. Yes, sir. So when you're first uploading your information to your cloud, which one of your mechanisms is securing that with your data? First uploading it. So you need. I'm deciding I want to go to the cloud. I need to upload my data. So this this is for the actual. It, it, you put it, you're, when you're putting it up there, you're not actually doing the single sign-on, you're not doing the authentication, you're not doing all of those pieces. You're interacting directly with your cloud service provider. Well, it's a good question, though. I mean, it's a good question because, well, you know, like we're doing that right now for our state department. We're extracting data and, and uh, encrypting that data, and we have to ship that data. That's typically how cloud providers move data, right? Um, depending on the service, there could be terabytes of data that you have to move. And you can't, you know, you can't download it, right? It takes forever and you're, you know, you make this. So, so typically we encrypt the data with, with tools from our, our PGP line um, and ship the data. And there's lots of ways you can, you know, you can hire an armed service to ship the data if you want um, to make sure that your service provider, your cloud provider gets that data and, and ingests that data. Um, and typically, your cloud provider should have a, a spelled out um, contract on how they're going to do that. In our case, we do. You know, I, I know I'm familiar with how we do that. And we, we, we typically encrypt it, ship it, ingest it, and then secure, you know, secure access to it. I mean, one of the things, he mentions data loss, right? So data, with data loss, when users are using a service, right, you have to be sure that the data that they're consuming or using doesn't leave your organization, even, even if it's in the cloud. What about thumb drives? You know, what if they're downloading some files to a thumb drive? How do you prevent that data on that thumb drive from being taken somewhere? You mentioned Stuxnet. Well, that's how Stuxnet got into the Iranian nuclear plant. Well, at least that's, um, that's, you know, that's what they're guessing. But, um, you know, same thing applies to the state of California, right? We, we can't count. Also, you know, recently there was a breach on a department here where someone inadvertently posted you know, information on a website, right? Data loss prevents that. It notifies, it scans your, your networks, it scans your, your browsers, or your, your, your websites, to make sure there's no, and it looks for patterns of bank accounts and social security networks. It has to look for al algorithms that um, would notify consumers of data, hey, this is data that probably shouldn't be on a website. Send it to your security officer, or maybe even shuts it off, so. So there's a lot of, you know, when he says ozone layer, there's a lot of products that make up that um, that layer that we, we can address. You don't necessarily come to me and say, hey, I want to buy ozone layer. You come to me and say, hey, we're looking at cloud, we're looking at here, here's some of the areas we want to address. Um, where should we start first? And that's a long conversation, a lot more time than we have today. But um, you bring us good questions. It sounds like you're looking at going to the cloud and, and moving data is, is the first and most important thing you can address.
Typically that ingestion is going to be on some sort of physical media just because your network right. costs are going to be astronomical if you try to do it across a, a pipe. Yeah. So I know when I, I know several of the uh, cloud service providers will go through and that, that's part of their you know, charging. They'll they'll go through and take it off of, you know, fifty Blu ray discs or whatever it is and you know couple of big hard drives, you ship it to them, they do the, the heavy lifting, and then you aren't paying for the net, network bandwidth as well. Any other questions? Over here, one. Yes, sir. So we send our data to the cloud and we encrypt it. Mm -hmm. Where does your product uh, do it? I have people trying to access it. Is this something that will be on a network device, or is it on a client? How does that deal with the uh, BYOD? If people need to access this stuff from different places, how do they get to that unencryption? So the question is, where would the decryption happen yeah. for uh, if if they're using this product in particular? Right. Um, so the key management actually happens on the uh, within the uh, gateway device. Okay, I, I mean the keys are going to be stored nearby. Let's leave it at that, and then from there. The interaction will take place. Um, if I recall correctly, let's see, you have a secured tunnel between your device and the uh, gateway, and then so keys will appropriately make their way down. Well, that, that really depends. I mean, it depends. I mean, if, you, if, the, if the cloud provider has a bunch of your data, and one of your policies for that provider is to provide encrypted data at rest, you know, they're probably going to have a policy that says, uh, or a, an offering that. That, that you know, you need to ask up front. Where's where's my data? In our case, you know, um, some of our solutions will allow you to encrypt the data, but you need to have typically an adapter that unencrypts and provides the data to the user. Um, so it, it can vary depending on the service that you're going to choose. Um, you know, we don't do all everything. Everything. You know, we're not um, a provider of cloud. Um, for you know, a lot of business functions like Salesforce. I mean, that's not necessarily our business. I mean, we're there to you know, um, teach you guys how to make sure your vendor is securing your data. And so I would certainly, it's a very good question, I would certainly talk to your provider and make sure they are providing some type of encryption for your data, depending on how, you know, how important that data is to you. Typically, the cloud service providers are going to use uh, data in motion protection, that's the TLS, uh, SSL that, that I mentioned earlier, and they're going to have data at rest uh, protections, so their hard drives will be encrypted. However, anytime it's in use, um, they aren't going to typically give that kind of protection. Um, depending on the utilization, like within this system, um, somebody tries to ship something out, they're not supposed to, um, it will be encrypted with keys that are going to be managed and uh, within the environment, and then some sort of whatever it is on that end uh, device, on that end platform, uh, will need to go through. Uh, I mean, if it's our stuff, it'll need to be PGP. They can get back through to the uh, gateway, which will have the, the keys associated with it. It's a pretty, that can be a pretty heavy conversation. Well, one so. of the things I've always been concerned about is we're putting our department's data out on a right. cloud. And it's shared with our base. The system administrator can see everything on our network. And that's right. So now you've got stuff out there. It's no different. Their system administrator probably can see everything that's there, unless we've got our own encryption routine that we encrypt the data before it goes there, so what they see is a bunch of garbage. Right. And, and that's actually something I've written about a couple of times. Um, yes. The and and oh by the way, if a warrant is issued. Every one of the, I take that back, there are two providers, there will soon be three providers that um, will not or cannot, cannot divulge keys. Um, iCloud, they'll, they'll, they'll happily turn keys over for a warrant. So even if it's, you know, the system's administ administrators can't necessarily get to it, but they will if they are issued a warrant. So. Uh, it, it's a heavy conversation. More than welcome to chat with you about it. Anything else? No more. Okay, sure. So, speaking of stickiness, say you implement this layer that goes online, 
mm -hmm. side, you want to pick another one. Okay. How easy is it to go to another vendor after that? So you're going to have to cull out the uh, policies, which you know I, I don't think there's going to be a migration stat a strategy for those. Um, you will be able to pull out um, if it's if they're direct usernames and passwords that are being associated with uh, the transactions. So instead of actually going through and, and taking care of like one-time passwords and things along those lines, if you are storing usernames and passwords, you can export those and then import them, but maybe import them. I don't know what the other provider is going to do. Um, if they are going to be uh, SAML assertions or something along those lines, you'll be able to, uh, uh, well, again, it comes down to your other, uh, other product vendor, but um, that's not something that's going to be, you can just nix that within this system. You don't actually have to import it and export it. Um, outside you, of that? Are you talking about this, the security layer? <laughs> yeah, say for example, or you have another product and then you want to bring on semantic. Yeah. So you're not locked in. Or say you want to try this, sort of pilot it, didn't fit your needs, you want to try this new layer. Okay. Well, that's that's a million dollar question. <laughs> but you know, once you have once you if you pick the solution and you've got a security product in there, um, you know, that's not meeting your needs, I mean that's that you know you I couldn't really answer that until I sat down with you and understood, you know, your your environment and what you would want to switch out, but you're typically going to have some sort of, I mean, the popular choice is AD um, or LDAP. Um, you will have some sort of interface for those. With ours, you would just simply import that. You're not going to have too many other, I, I know of three, maybe five vendors that are doing this sort, this sort of thing, and you're not going to be importing and exporting for most of them. Yeah, I mean, the LDAP seems easy. It's these other layers, yeah. these other services within this layer. Yeah, like DLP, right? I mean, DLP, in my in my opinion, is should be especially if you're if you have a department that it is health related, finance related, a house is critical information. You are at serious risk if you do not have a DLP solution in place. Symantec, and I'll plug our product, is the clear leader in that space. It's the one thing we do very very well. And um, again, Not the it only will thing, monitor but. your network, it will <laughs> monitor your devices, it will monitor your websites. Um, this, this issue, like with public health, we could have prevented. Um, it was inadvertent, it wasn't it was an accident, right? We can prevent those things. If you have a DLP service that's not meeting your needs right now, um, call me. We'll come in, we even do free assessments, but we'll come in and let the, the product run and scan your environment. And 30 days later, come back and, and show you Hey, here's where you're losing data. We, we actually, uh, I've done a couple of those assessments that he's speaking of. And within those assessments, um, we've identified huge, huge is issues. And, and it, it was something where they signed the next day. Because, I mean, that, that 10,000 user uh, situation, um, yeah, they actually found that to be eye-opening and when we brought it up to their chief privacy officer it was how do we fix that particular piece yeah. it's like we identified it because of x y and z here's how you would prevent it yeah. so are you doing more than algorithms based on the data itself are you also doing say size or location or for which well, for example, I mean, <laughs> sorry the, the common ones you mentioned your social security number driver's license number you can numbers. you can you can you can so, determine it's a good question you can say what do we want to what do we want to scan right so i mean can it be I mean, one of the things short answer is anything okay. yeah uh, D, the the dlp solution yeah. you can protect whatever is important to you you may protect it well, if it's cad you, drawings it not be important to someone else right. so you can tell the product this is what we want to scan. If it's something kind of complicated, we might have to engineer it, but we can, we can, it's not but you're looking at the data itself as opposed to yes. the size of the data or? Uh, you can, you do can that do that as well. As well. Yeah. Um, actually, I was dinged on, uh, I, I was a contractor on site for a little while. I was dinged on forwarding, uh, forwarding something that they had fingerprinted, a PowerPoint right. that they had fingerprinted. Uh, it was attached to a meeting invite. I forwarded the meeting invite to my uh, phone at the time, 
and to, to my corporate phone so that it would show up on right. my calendar. And I got a call from their security office. Hey, I mean, it was literally within five minutes. Okay. Hey, why are you sending out our... So there are ways that uh, we are we're constantly having conversations with our legal affairs division. How do mm -hmm. we protect their data? How do we protect just that same thing, that same conversation yesterday yes. was, how do I prevent my conversation with the deputy director from being forwarded? Absolutely. You know. It works, it, it works beautifully well. It, it was blocked in my case. Uh, it was blocked immediately. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the one looking at those security <coughs> alerts. It's like, yeah. okay, Automation can take place. Uh, it, it can go directly into a remedy ticket. It can automatically notify their manager, block the transaction. You can go through and whatever you want as a as a response. It can some, it can some be set customers up. choose to just notify a security <coughs> officer or an administrator. Some say block it. So it's it's really a policy that we set up to meet your needs yeah. um, you know, for you know, for your organization. Yes, ma'am. So we're using several cloud solutions in our organization. Are you saying we can just resolve some of that single sign-on to all the cloud solutions? So the question is having a single sign-on solution for all of the cloud yeah. providers that you are currently using. Yes, that is exactly what it does. Um, you can have federation, usernames and passwords. In fact, you can even, because of this system, um, hey, I only need to remember that single sign-on, right? So if you're going to use a, a, a token of some sort, you know, you, you type in your AD password or whatever it is, LDAP password, and then you use that token, you, you attach that on the end, um, you can go through and make extraordinarily complicated passwords that are stored within this O3 product that then they don't have to remember. They can rotate those out on 30, 60, 90 day increments you don't have to remember any of that stuff as the end user. Okay, all of that's taken care of in policy, behind the scenes, et cetera, and you know, files that are shipped uh, back and forth on the back end. So it, it makes it that much more tantalizing as far as security goes because you're not having to manage, your, your users are not having to use the same password on LinkedIn as they are on your, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, sales site. Or, or corporate private information. Okay. So, that's it. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Joe.